And this is when I finally met Andy Warhol on my turntable while it was still spinning. <laughs> Everyone have a good time and just get drunk. <laughs> Cheers to that. Good afternoon and welcome to Luke Jones The Other Way. Now I've got a fantastic guest in today, somebody who's been here for, ooh, I think more than a quarter of a century. He's made this place his home all the way from New York. So let's go and meet him. Hey, great, great, great. It's the famous DJ Stanley, come on in. Oh. Let me get you a drink. Okay, so Stanley, tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you from and how did you end up here in Moscow? <laughs> well, it was a long time ago, but we'll start from the beginning. Okay. I was born in Newark, New Jersey. Uh, that was many years ago. And um, I decided to get into the music industry and I went to New York City to work. And I just so happened to fell into the club called Studio 54. One of the, of course, everyone should know this one from New York City. That was in 1981. Wow. Yeah. So in 1981, I worked for Steve Rubell, and it was really exciting. And from there, it was, it was just history. I decided to say, OK, let's go and do something more. And what happened, Studio 54 was closing because Steve right. Rubell was, you know, he had some problems there. So he sent me down to the Caribbean. And I lived in St. Thomas. And many people don't know, there was a Studio, studio 54 down there the Caribbean. It's a franchise? Yeah, so a franchise. And there was a little one inside of a hotel. And this was like the summer getaway where all the jet setters from the winter would come there for the summer to get the Studio 54 name. Oh, it was wow. wonderful. That sounded like fun in St. Thomas, a little bit warmer than New York. Oh, it was great. It was wonderful, Luke. I tell you, it was something else. So I came back in 82, 83, and then there was this new scene going on, like New Wave, where you hear people like the Thompson Twins, Boy George, Depeche Mode, all of these crazy bands was happening. And because I was working in the Caribbean back in 82, I was getting all of these different types of cultures coming in. I was getting people from the carrier, aircraft carriers. I was getting people from, from Dutch. I was getting the Spanish. I was getting everything. So my music changed. It wasn't the urban disco sound anymore. So it just so happened when I came back to New York, it was this big scene and it was a club called Danceteria and Area, these two clubs. And this is when I finally met Andy Warhol. Andy Warhol, wow. yes, and it was great because uh, how I got to meet him, every week, every month, this club would do installations. And they would take these clubs and they would bring artists in. There was, uh, every week I would come across Jean-Michel Basqua, uh, Keith Haring, Andy Warhol, Peter Max was there. And these people, I learned from them. This is like, it wasn't like, oh, well, you're a celebrity and we're just the little communers. <laughs> we were there working together, oh, doing installations. There was one time, the direct acts, we said, Stanley, before you get your check, can you <laughs> before you get your payment, <laughs> can you come and help Andy? And so I went over and met him. This how do you do, it was great. And Jean-Michel Basqua, I helped him with an installation there. And he was sitting there, he was just smoking at that time uh, to smoke uh, marijuana was something very, very like, well, wait a minute, and this is back in 84. And he says, hey, thank you very much, man. He had this really cool voice. Says, Here, can you hear, this is for you, can you take this? It was like, it was his artwork and he just cut a piece off the installation that was off, that didn't fit on the crate. And he says, Here, take this, this is for you. And I said, no, you don't have to give me that. I'm doing this for my heart. It's okay. <laughs> that painting is worth right now $500,000. <laughs> and I'm like, what, what? I Yes. How did it happen that you got from New York to Moscow? Well, I was playing at this club called Tattoo. This was the owners of Studio 54 at the time. That was 10 years later. This was back in 1993, if I'm correct. And this man came to me, Russian. He says, ah, he had two guys with him. He said, I like your music. It's really, really good. Yeah. He says, I want to bring you over to Russia. I said, no. <laughs> Russia? I don't know. He says, Oh, okay, so he goes sit down and I'm, I'm sitting there dancing with the music because I didn't take him. You know, everybody say, "Oh, I love you, oh, this marry me or whatever," <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and 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 I just didn't take anything of it. So he comes back, he gives he gives he gives his his security his, his security guard some money, and he just took one hundred dollar bills. Two, 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 two. He counted to twelve hundred dollars on my turntable while it was still spinning. <laughs> And I'm like looking at that, my song is about to finish, and I'm looking at that. 
That was a lot of money back then. I said, yeah, well, back then that was like, wow, for a tip, that's yeah. great. 1200 <laughs> for a tip. He said, I want you to go to Brooklyn, and I want you to give this to Olga. She's going to give you a visa to come next week. And I said. Spontaneous. Yes, and I said, OK. <laughs> so I came to Russia June the 23rd, 1993. Fantastic. So you got this visa to Russia, how long was it for? It was only for three months because okay. I, I, told, I told the guy, I said, well, if I stay, I'm not only going to stay for three months. That's all I can do. I want to get back to New York. Well, you had a job then. Didn't yeah, you? I had a job. It was, I'm fine. Let's go. So I went for an extension. <laughs> so you enjoyed your first three months? Oh, I loved it. I was the first job I had was at Metellica. The first place I lived was on a boat. Do you, do you remember a boat called Alexander Block? Yeah. That was in night. That was back in... Um, yeah, that was back in August at that time. So I was living there till August, and they said, well, okay, if you like it, we'll give you a place to stay on Busha Dagomilovskaya, or in that area, you know that area. Kievska, so, yeah. Yeah, Kievska, it was great, beautiful area. So I stayed there, and I worked, and I played, and I was with a lot of people, hanging out with Lima Vaikale. We used to dance every night. <laughs> the, the group Lube, Irina Panarovska. Because that's actually when I turned up. I came to Russia as a student in September 93. Oh my so goodness. it was only just shortly after yeah. uh, you arrived. Yeah. Oh my goodness, yes. That was something, and at this time, I I said, well, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to stay, but I'm not sure. So I decided, and I opened a CD store. You opened a CD store? Yeah, I opened wow. a CD store. I was one of the first uh, distributors here. I used to carry every two weeks, every two weeks, from New York to Moscow, 22 suitcases. We used to fly <laughs> from... luggage. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> and this is when I started working at a club called Hermitage. Now, this place was great because it was the first place before when I first came here, it was only the mafia and the girls. Yeah. That was it. Either you had those two, anybody Not else... In between, huh? Yes, anything in between, it just didn't count. Uh, I remember we, I wanted to go to cross the street one time in Moscow. They, they, you know, of course the police officer said, no, you don't do that, you go underground. I said, underground? What's that? Because I always was in, I had always had a private car. So I said, I wanted to take a taxi. This, I never want to take a, I want to get with the people. <laughs> I went underground and I said, oh, this is where everybody's at. This is where all the kiosks, this is yeah. where they shop. It wasn't like, you know, I was thinking of New York, like, you know, right on, on, yeah. the, on, on sea level, you say. <laughs> but it was, it was all down, so I really enjoyed it. And I met people, and they told me about this club, Hermitage. I played there, it was wonderful, because we was meeting people uh, from all walks of life. Like, this is how the Night Wolves first started. This is how certain bands like Dvar Samalaw and Nogus Velo, all these groups had started at the time. They say about the 1960s that if you remembered it, you weren't there. But I don't know a lot of people who remembered the mid to uh, end of the 90s, so... <laughs> Cheers to that, yeah. What happened next? Well... <laughs> I got a job offer to play at a place that was doing fine, but then it was just losing its momentum, as you say. And um, his name was Douglas Steele. This was in 1998. Now, Hungry Duck was open before that, a, a year, I think, or two before yeah. that. But it was very, very clean. As we <laughs> so we said, Douglas came to me and a person named Johnny. He said, what do you can do with this place? What can we do? Well, we said, well, maybe we do a strip tease. He says, oh, okay, strip tease. But he says, now girls, everybody's doing that. No, let's do it for women. And there was no strip clubs for women at that time. That's unheard of, of course. And we just wanted to do a ladies' night, basically what it was, but to bring these uh, artists in. So we got together, we called some people who was working at another place who said, uh, Dylan, that's his name, he says, can you bring some, some of your guys in? I'll do the music, Johnny will be the manager, he'll take care of everything. So we did that and it became a success. Now, every night we used to let about, I would say about 400 girls in. This was the infamous ladies night. Yeah, this was the ladies <laughs> night. They would wait outside to get in, we would have free drinks, which we called like a countdown, in which 
five drinks for one and so on down. These girls would just get on the stage and dance on the top of the bar stool, as you see, we would just dance and I would play the music. And at a certain time, it was at 12 o'clock. Now don't forget, we start at seven in the afternoon, <laughs> seven at night. So everyone would come after work, after school, after, so it was great, it wasn't too late, so it was good to, to hang out for a minute. So after that. Ah, that's when they let the dudes in. That's right, <laughs> they let the dudes in two hours later. But before that, we used to just have everyone have a good time and just get drunk. And getting drunk with these strip shows, they started to get the little, little, little freaky deaky, as we say. The girls were dancing, and it's interesting because the girls were into it. They wanted to dance with the strippers. And it was more of like signing up to be able to dance with the strippers. If you didn't have, if you weren't on the list to dance with the strippers, yeah. there were like actual like conflicts saying, no, I'm next, I'll be there. No, we'll have you next Tuesday. How about that? The next Tuesday will be fine, okay? Okay, fine. So it was more of like women's, it was more of like women's liberation. I'm gonna be honest with you, it wasn't anything like, like, oh, someone's exploiting or anything like that. It was more, we didn't, we just stood back and it was all happening there. And I used to be on the microphone, I would say, Dylan, are you ready? He would say, yes, in the background. And the girls will just be screaming in the circle. And I would say, lights, camera, action, and then the lights would just go out and the spotlight goes on Dylan. Dylan will walk out slowly and then he will just peek around the room and look and see which girl he would like to dance with. And the girl would come and dance. She would come up, he would pull her on the stage, and the rest was history. <laughs> well, all this would have been denounced as Western decadence, resulting in a one-way ticket to the Gulag. Well, the Hungry Duck is obviously a legendary place. It even got a page in Time magazine. That's right, right that's <laughs> right. It just summed up the new Russia in the 1990s. Uh huh, that's um, right. And I remember that it got closed down one night when yeah. uh, some communist, was it some communist deputies were being shown around Moscow nightlife? Well, what, <laughs> what happened was, um, it was just a typical night. We knew they were coming to come to hang okay. out, so we made a special announcement. But the mistake that someone made was to play... Was it the Soviet National Anthem? Well, <laughs> that's right. To play the Soviet na National Anthem at the beginning of this show. I think if he didn't play that Soviet National Anthem, everything would have been okay oh, today. Okay. So even the male stripper... They yeah, have that was... I think Diller decided that, okay, I'm going to do that. And we shouldn't have let him... <laughs> We should have, I should have kept that part to myself with the music. <laughs> as, as music producer, I must say, I failed on that one. We closed the club down. Yeah. But, <laughs> but it, was, I mean, it, was, it was a legend at the time. Now, yeah. even the old Soviet anthem is just another bit of Hungry Duck entertainment. And as the hustle begins again, the godfather of this den of iniquity. What happened after that? So after that, um, we closed the club down and we had to move on. So I left Hungry Duck and um, we moved on to a place called Voodoo Lounge. Now Voodoo Lounge was a really interesting place because it was, it was, how would you say, Chesterfield meets, at that time, Titanic. Yeah. Let's say Titanic. And it was very, as you, as you say, uh, modern, trendy, moderny. <laughs> Well, 1998, we all know what happened then. On the 17th of August, the currency crashed. Do you oh, that? yes, that's right, that's I right. I remember it was six rubles to the dollar. That's right. I sell, and then I remember we went out for lunch one day and it was nine. That's right. At the end of the week, it was 24. That's right. And so maybe uh, the Hungry Duck was a catalyst for that. I'm not quite I sure. I wonder, I really wonder, because uh, the place was um, really doing well and um, just everything just collapsed. Not just uh, the ruble, the club itself, everything yeah. just... Because I remember that was obviously a very tough three years. I left. I went yeah. to Poland, Czech Republic. I got back in 2001, which is when we met. Right. And, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the iconic club in well, the noughties, as we call it. <laughs> in the noughties. Douglas and all of, the, all of us decided to move to Chesterfields. Now, Chesterfields was a great place because it was right smack dab in the middle. Of, the, of Moscow. We used to have fun there because we used to bring a lot of good bands there. Yep. One of the things that we did was bring a lot of good bands. And with these bands, we brought all of the fans. And with these fans, we brought all of the girls. 
And with these girls, we brought all of the guys to hang out with these girls. But there were some things going on to where you can have girls who you can dance with, and there's girls who you can just sit with. Now, these girls you used to just sit with weren't just, oh. <laughs> well, they weren't your ordinary girls. <laughs> you know what they say, that uh, there was a newspaper called The Exile, mm -hmm. which used to review the uh, bars and clubs in Moscow. Right. And they said about Chesterfield, they said, this is the only place with girls you pay for and girls for free. That's right. <laughs> so this is what we have today. Well, then. And uh, it was great because I did a lot of uh, parties there. I even brought the Beatles over. The Beatles the cover Beatles. bands, yes. Oh, cover bands. Yeah, remember? Didn't be worried for me. Well, 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 they were a tribute band, but they were great. They were really good there. We used to do a lot of contests, things like that. But then, um, again, the 90s from 98, 99, 2000s to the 2005s, everything was changing. So we had to move on. Well, one of the things I remember about the Boar House, which we then became called after they, they renamed it from Chesterfield, was the fact that it was packed every night of the week. Right. I remember Doug Steele saying to me, he's from Canada, he said, look, you cannot make money out of a bar just on a Thursday, Friday, Saturday night. You've got to be full every night of the week, otherwise right. forget it. Sure. And I remember things like Countdown on right. Monday night. You pay for one Long Island iced tea, you get four. That's right. They had specials on the food. The place was packed right. every night of right. the week. Right. And right. it was the one place that everyone went. That's right. And that's, right. that's obviously when we met because right. uh, you were the DJ there. Yeah, that's right. The music was really fun because we was playing music from all over the world, everywhere, everything. Just name it, we played it. Hallelujah. <laughs> A side question, Stanley. Uh, how, how long did it take you to learn Russian? Well, actually, it took me all my life to learn Russian. <laughs> I'm still learning you Russian. Didn't learn, you didn't know anything no. before you came? No, I didn't know anything. I really started learning Russian uh, during the Chesterfield times because there were a lot of people coming there that didn't speak English. So I had to learn. I took a couple of courses. Um, there were a couple of expats. We took a course together, the two for one special. Not <laughs> <laughs> on the drinks. No, no, the drinks. <laughs> So we took a couple of courses together. It was good, it was okay, but it wasn't enough. We were already learning when we were meeting beautiful women and beautiful friends, like, you know, just hanging out. So why pay for this if we had it here, Get you it know? Free. Right, we got it here. So this is what happened and I learned. Welcome to the show. We call it the Stan Williams Sessions here. Every Friday, baby, from nine o'clock to 10 o'clock, we are in the group and we are ready to go. From that, um, I decided to get into the radio business because the club business was good. Moscow was fine, it's wonderful, but Russia and the regions are the best. I, 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 don't, I don't know for yourself, but for me, I really love traveling. Playing, my first place that I've ever been to in Russia playing was in Siktiv Car. Wow. Oh, this was, uh, this was interesting. This was my first gig in Russia. Now, Russia at that time was not a, a place where we're good for tourists. The, the only stop in Russia for an international artist was only to Moscow. Or maybe St. Petersburg? Yes, maybe, maybe. St. Petersburg, yeah. that's right. But not Siktivka. Not Siktivka. <laughs> to go outside of that, uh, you don't want to do that. Now, I have a promoter who said, I'm going to bring you over there. Now, when I got there, the promoter stole my telephone. <laughs> I said, how can the promoter steal your telephone? <laughs> Anyway, that's a long story. I forgive him. But anyway, from there, I started traveling to different places and using a booking agency and usually soccer lens. Um, I used to go there maybe three times for the year. I've been there about six times already. Then you go to uh, Kamchatka. These places are beautiful. And they're a long way from Moscow. Yeah, Kamchatka is ten hours. Well, usually it's eight, eight, nine. Nine, yeah, that's right. Ten, eight hours. Domestic flights. Right. I mean, these are know. domestic. These are domestic <laughs> domestic flights. And uh, a lot of the store places like Nakhotka, and you have um, uh, Baglagashinsk. Where's, oh, Blagovitsyansk. Blagovitsyansk. I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. These places are great. I mean, it's unbelievable. And I decided to open a booking agency myself. <laughs> What really got me into DJing was to make people happy. I love it when I see someone and I can get them to laugh or I can uh, just get them to smile. But instead of, I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't a good comedian, so I couldn't do that. So <laughs> I love DJing. <laughs> Outside of Moscow, where else do you like going the most? Oh, 
Well, my favorite place, of course, is down in the south. It's there's, warmer. There's, there's warmer there. Uh, there's two regions I like. One is Sochi, Krasny Palana in that area, which is really like good. Yes, we have Rosa Kuta. It's beautiful because you, you're getting three different climates at once. Um, so that's something good for me. And my other place is Vladivostok, wow. Nahotka. I love Vladivostok because it reminds me of San Francisco or any place with mountains that's going well, on. That's what they call it, San Francisco of the East. Isn't yes, it? yes, yes, yes. San Francisco of the East, yes. So. It's one of the places that I like because of the sea. And my favorite place, believe it or not, is Crimea. The Crimea? Yeah, Crimea is really good for me. Oh, fantastic. But uh, obviously, you've been here a long time, almost yeah. half your life. Is there anything you miss about your life back in the US? Mm. Uh, to tell you really, what I really miss is shopping. <laughs> shopping, to believe, it or, to believe it or not. All these years, I still miss shopping. Really? But you can get most stuff here nowadays. Uh, not really. You can get a copy of it, but you, ah. can get, you can get an actual clothing. You can um, get certain foods that I'm used to. I love seafood. And because I'm living in a landlocked city, it's hard to get seafood. I was eating seafood every day. It's like part of my religion. I, when I came to Russia, it was, there weren't any shops here. I, I was one of the people that stood in the line at McDonald's back in the day. It was like <laughs> a thousand of us out there having fun and getting inside. Yeah, I was one of them, you know, so. <laughs> Now, obviously, these were two superpowers, the U.S. Yeah. and the USSR. Right. And obviously, I mean, I think that uh, Russia still has a little bit of a love-hate relationship with the uh, Yes, United they do. States. They do, uh, yes. Yeah. What's it like as an American living here? I mean, obviously, you know, the politics. Yeah, yeah, like, well. Do you ever feel that, uh, you know, being an American here? Or do, <laughs> do you find that Russians see past where you're from? Uh, well, uh, there were different areas. Because I've lived here over a quarter of a century, I can say, can tell you by each century, <laughs> <laughs> by, each, by each decade. In the early 90s, it was very good, wonderful, fine. We came to the, the, the 2000s, it was okay, it was good, it was a little warm. Yeah. But after 2000, it started getting, well, we don't know, we'll see. Yeah, and then right now in the 2020, it's more of like, well, some people, I have to choose it when somebody asks me where am I from, I don't tell them where I'm from. <laughs> some people guess. ask me, let them guess. <laughs> Sometimes I say, I'm from Jamaica, man. You know, <laughs> really, because I don't want you the- You the dreadlocks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I don't, you know, you just, sometime you're in, you're in a taxi or somewhere, you don't, you don't want to go through it. You just want to get me <laughs> home, you know? So I do feel that tension, yes, I do feel it. But now as things are changing where I'm feeling the tension and it's balancing. And I, sometimes I can understand understand why they feel it, that tension. Yeah. But we're in between two, yeah. and a, what do you say, a rock and a stone? How do you say that? <laughs> rock and a hard place. Rock and a hard place, that's the one. <laughs> I remember my Canadian grandfather saying to me when I was young, he said, look, when you go abroad, you represent your country. Right. And if you behave badly, people will think that everybody from that country is like that. You know, I can remember, I was in a taxi in Volgograd a couple of years ago, uh -huh. and uh, we were speaking English, and the cab driver said, where are you from? I said, we're from England. And I was like, he didn't look Russian. He was slightly darker. And I said, um, so where are you from? He said, Armenia. I was like, oh, right, okay. And, he, and you know, I spoke a few words of Armenian to him and he was like, Britain voted against uh, oh. you know, calling uh, the yes. Armenian genocide a genocide. And I was like, well, oh, what's oh, oh. I didn't know what to say about You see? You know? so, 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 you know, just somebody, again, was saying like 100 years ago, Britain did this. And I was like, well, uh, nothing to do with me. You're representing <laughs> England, so exactly, you're going you know. to be the one. So this is the thing that I'm not really into. Do you find most people can see past that, though? Yeah, some people see past that. There's a lot who see past that. But uh, they don't know why. Like, it's interesting, there was a situation uh, back in the summer where this Black Lives Matter situation was happening. And people were just calling me from left and right, what do you think about it? I'm like, I don't know, which I do know, but it's a long story. The only time, how the only way, got? yeah, how long you've got, <laughs> yes. Because it's not, it's not just, you have to be American to really understand it. You have to yeah. be really, really into it. So it goes back thousands, hundreds of years. But you could say the same thing about when the West looks at Russia and things going on here. It's like, well, you know, have you been here? Do you actually know what's going on here? How can you comment on something if you've never even been here? It's the right, same thing. right. It's the same thing. And I, I get that. Some of the people are telling me about uh, from here, telling me about what the American situation. I said, have you been to America? <laughs> no. So, so how can you tell me? I mean, you, you what are we talking for? Yeah. So uh, this is the same way, but in the States, it's a little bit different because in the States, not many people 
are in tune to Europe. I'm not, I'm not going to say Russia, <laughs> Europe alone. So, I mean, to them, to go to Europe is just Paris. And we go to Paris and we, uh, voulez-vous ce soir, and that's it. And so when you start speaking about Russia, no one's, I mean, you know, no one's doing it. Uh, obviously with my uh, mother's side of the family being from Canada, um, the snowbirds, they go down to what we call Canada's southernmost province, Florida, uh, for the winter. And when we go down there, I remember when the uh, Crimea was annexed back in 2014, and I was in Florida and I came back and my colleagues at work were saying to me, uh, so what do the Americans think about the Crimea being annexed? I was like, they don't. They like, don't. Oh, no, 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 it's like, no, trust me, they don't. they don't. They're interested in their neighbor buying a new kettle or, right. I think at the time, should Justin Bieber have gone to a prison in the US or in Canada? Right, right, right. Britney <laughs> Spears' children be allowed to live with her or not? Right, you know? exactly. That was important. Exactly. That's important <laughs> to them. And uh, more of the international politics is only among the politicians. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, the rest of people don't really care. It's so, like, everyone, all of these things that you hear is from the politicians. We don't really care. Yeah. Life is life. We live only once. Exactly. Well, I think on that note, that's a great time to uh, have another sip. Yes. Um, Cheers to you. you know, Stanley, look, thank you ever so much for uh, thank being you. part of our video. And, thank uh, you. I take it, no plans to go home? Well, not yet. <laughs> We're trying to, though. <laughs> yeah, or maybe for a visit. Anyway. Right, yes. Uh -huh. really, well, look, thank you very much. Make sure you follow DJ Stanley, Instagram, Facebook. He's everywhere. He's yeah. traveling all over Russia. I sometimes think it's hard to find someone who's been to more places in Russia than I have. Mm -hmm. But I think... Uh, Stanley uh, probably beats me on that. We need to sit down and put a tick against every city. Well, yeah, I think you got me internationally, though. <laughs> Is it? <laughs> he yeah. does have me there. <laughs> really? Really? So, look, that was another edition of Luke Jones the Other Way. Make sure that you uh, subscribe, like, follow, uh, leave a comment, preferably a nice one, and preferably in that order. Thank you very much. Cheers.